Our next steps to space. This time we go back to the moon to learn to live, to work, to invent, to create. Today's News Talk Radio, TNT. Welcome back, folks. Welcome back to TNT, Today's News Talk. Patrick Henningsen, your host here. Uh, We are streaming out live on the audio and video streams uh, on multiple platforms. Some of you are watching us on YouTube right now. We're also streaming out live on X Twitter as well. Uh, We're going to restream that on our feed at uh, 21 Wire right now. So you'll be able to see us there as well as hearing us on the various platforms, which you normally do. So appreciate your listenership as well as your viewership, everybody in the TNT chat community whether you're listening or watching you want to be in the tnt chat bar that's where the action is during the program we got a great community in there we got some great people sharing opposition research memes uh dropping truth bombs uh, there's a few debates going on as well we got a ver- variety of views in the tnt chat community that's why it's vibrant and we love everybody in there thank you guys for keeping it alive uh there during the program appreciate you now uh, we're going to go uh switch gears right now back to the united states we're going to talk about about that all important issue of the 2024 elections and election interference, election meddling. But I'm not talking about foreign interference in this case. We are talking about domestic interference meddling, which we saw plenty of in the 2020 election. Anybody who's honest looking at that whole Farago can tell you there was just plenty there. Uh, it was so much, in fact, that it was impossible to adjudicate uh, before the, you know, the time between the, when the polls closed and then the, the, the month that followed counting votes, which was insane. Uh, and then the swearing in of the next president, there just wasn't enough time to adjudicate that. And I think the nefarious uh, forces behind the scenes have factored that in as well. This is one of the uh, uh, chess matches that's being played now uh, with every election cycle. Unbelievable. Let's break some of this down, though. I want to welcome on to the program uh, independent journalist Brian Pafels joining us on the line right now. Brian has uh, penned a very provocative yet informative article here, which uh, we've retweeted as well. It's up on our uh, at 21 wire feed right now, just above the show post and the live stream from TNT. The headline reads as such Meta's Facebook lists, uh, quote, voting rights and elections position on LinkedIn. So I want to welcome Brian Pafel right now into the program. Brian, thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me, Patrick. So, Brian, uh, we're a little concerned here uh, by the headline in your article, uh, which is up on uh, nationalfile.com. Brian, the headline basically uh, portends that a lot of these problems that we all saw and we knew were a problem in the 2020 election and the midterms in 2022. These things have not been addressed. These have not been fixed. And the same actors who have been pouring uh, fortunes into getting the results they want, uh, they're at it again in the 2024 election. Walk us through this story. This is fascinating. Well, I think the the first thing to note is that since 2016, uh, Meta has uh, spent uh, $20 billion on elections. So, uh, I mean, even on their website, uh, it explicitly states that social media plays a significant part in the election process. Um, but in regards to this specific job, uh, it's a software development position, but they want you to have a legal background. They want you to have a JD. Um, it is uh, to work with um, a strategy with uh, nonprofits and other advocacy groups. Uh, they also state that its intended purpose is to limit uh, voter suppression uh, that is targeted against um, what they say as historically marginalized communities. Um, and they're hoping, as they say, to uh, secure a democratic election. But I, I think we can kind of you know, read between the lines here and see that they're gonna be doing some sort of suppression um they're going to be doing boosting of what they deem is correct and moral i mean it even says in their report uh they want to amplify the good and minimize or mitigate the bad um there's just so much here that really exposes it 
But I think people, uh, when, when they think of Facebook, they kind of disregard it, especially people that are very, very uh, politically invested. They look at X as being, you know, the, the, the core of the political discourse. But we got to remember uh, the demographics that are primarily using uh, meta platforms. I mean, just just for for, for Facebook, uh, it's the majority is twenty five to thirty four, and then uh, it it bounces back up uh, with uh, the boomer generation. So uh, it shouldn't be discounted. It it truly shouldn't. Even though you don't use the platform and you don't think it has this much influence, it's going to have a significant influence. I mean, it's just it's just so evident uh, on you know, what they have on their website and what they list about, you know, the discourse, um, you know, fact checking. It's just so much. Uh, it's really unbelievable. And I, I could dive further into it. There, <laughs> It's unreal. Uh, I, I don't know what to say in regards to this. I, I don't think big tech should be interfering in these elections. And at this point, uh, Meta is perfectly fine with it. And they, they even say that this is a reality. This is going to be the future of, uh, of how elections are. So, so let's, let's just put the shoe on the other foot, uh, uh, Brian. Uh, suppose, this suppose Truth Social had the same market, had the same market share as, as Facebook. Or, or let's say Trump bought uh, a, a platform that, or, or a, a leading uh, MAGA uh, figure had bought a platform that had the same uh, reach and the same sort of user base as Facebook or Instagram, uh, and they would they were running ads like this, and they were pumping money into you know putting drop boxes out and so forth, ballot harvesting, all of this stuff that Mark Zuckerberg uh, was involved in in 2020, and you know what the media reaction would be. Um, this story would be like. Woodward and Bernstein, Watergate, sparks would fly. Uh, it would be a national outrage. People would say, this is a major threat to our democracy, and we need to protect our democracy. So clearly, Brian, th there's a partisan angle to this. Um, there's a partisan angle, but there's also kind of a globalist technocracy angle too. Because this position that they're advertising for, Brian, it just sounds like it, it's something straight out of the technocrats' handbook where you have this merger of certain government interests and certain corporate interests. But that, that to me, is one of the most frightening things about this, all, all with the veneer of protecting our democracy. Uh, what, what do you think? Well, I, I think that is, you know, definitely the case. Um, I, I know uh, corporate media doesn't take uh, um, independent journalists seriously. Uh, I tried to prop this story up to several corporate media outlets, and you know, I, I didn't get much of a response. Um, I, I'm not really surprised, uh, but you know, I would like to add that Facebook, well, Meta in general, Meta has uh, has significant influence over our uh, local elected officials. I mean, uh, they even note on their website that they, since 2020, they have sent over 540 million notifications for politicians. Uh, also, they have uh, other techniques. Um, they have one in which they, they, they call it um, changing the perception of an issue. Um, so politicians, I, I would guess that they would, they would verify all this stuff. And, you know, if a, if a right wing uh, individual were to, you know, try to, uh, you know, smoothen out uh, what they said or uh, a policy position, I think they would deny it. Um, and most of the nonprofits and the fact checkers that are going to be in play on Meta's platform are left wing. Uh, I mean, they're, they're using the international uh, fact checking network, which is uh i think it's owned by uh pointer and if we know about mm -hmm. pointer they operate with uh politifact and they have uh they they blacklisted several cons conservative outlets i think the free beacon uh the washington examiner uh, i mean it's just it's just so evident and it's in our face and there really isn't much we can do 
So, so let, let, let's look at what what they what Mark Zuckerberg, Meta, what they have done. And, and, and by the way, the censorship on Instagram and the, Instagram is a very popular platform. There's a lot of politics on there, or at least there was. Um, it's definitely on par with TikTok in terms of you know virality of the content on there. But so you've got basic suppression of speech you've got flagging of certain types of content uh on a part along partisan lines in other words suppressing conservative or right-wing content uh and then boosting uh uh democrat and left-wing or progressive content so that's pretty clear that happens i'm a victim of this i'm sure you are and many people you know um uh brian as well even though i don't i'm not like a, i don't wave the conservative flag um but i've been sort of you know uh labeled by these the, whatever the mechanisms are behind the scenes that manage what content's visible and not so that you've got that the censorship aspect and the suppression aspect so Z zuckerberg's actually uh putting money on the ground uh targeting key precincts in key swing states zucker boxes for drop boxes you, you've got pretty much legal ballot harvesting uh in some of these states they're taking full advantage of that with huge ground teams so you've got that level of interference that level of of meddling from big tech it's just unbelievable but then google is the biggest search engine in the world it's 90 95 percent of all searches go through google and uh, i think it was dr robert epstein's done some great da data analysis on this they're sending election reminders out only to democrats and not republicans on election day he said that had a potential swing of i think uh if i'm reading his data correctly between seven and 15 percent that's proven so i mean the, these companies all seem to be working um in lockstep and despite the fact brian that you know half their user base um probably do not approve or support um the the active measures that they're doing uh in elections so i mean I, I i'm reading this here i have to read this ad uh, that you posted in your article uh at meta we have a responsibility uh, to everyone who uses our services to amplify the good and mitigate the harm to make sure that people are safe on meta what are they talking about brian i mean safe from ideas safe from exposure to certain candidates uh it's hard to work this out but there's definitely an intention here go ahead yeah uh there there certainly is a uh suppression of uh people that are more on the right um i, I would argue even moderates at this point um uh they they put a lot of different claims they say that they're trying to disrupt um foreign interference and um covert influence that's domestic which we know is uh you know a lot of nonsense let's be frank um and they also tout that they've designated uh 700 hate groups and 400 uh so-called white supremacist organizations so uh this is uh it's just remarkable we, we we know that this stuff is just not true uh you know when it comes down to the reality of it uh to have that many that many uh hate groups especially 400 white supremacist organizations that's ridiculous what where are they uh uh how are they able to quantify that how are they able to actually uh, empirically, you know, uh, show that these groups have this identitarian uh, viewpoint. It's really, you know, uh, people that are, for instance, um, people that are want to secure the borders for the United States, they will label them as racist, white supremacists. And I, I think that's how that they would categorize this stuff. And I think that's how they'll do, they'll do it with the, the politicians. And we know that almost every right-wing politician wants to secure the border so they're going to be de-boosted de they're going to be flagged um and they've also talked about uh using something that's similar to community notes uh i know that they're going to use it on threads but if you go on threads it's just a completely lost platform um <laughs> it's just yeah. all left-wing you you're a right-winger you go on there you get demolished 
it's all identity politics. I mean, I, I wouldn't even bother with that platform. But Facebook is something different, um, you know. Uh, and if they, especially, I, I would say, uh, especially to the boomer generation, uh, they they utilize it tremendously, tremendously. And if they see something and it's being, you know, propped up by uh, Meta, then they're probably going to believe it. They're not going to question the narrative. I mean, they're a generation that has been uh, born through corporate media. Uh, television was their big thing of getting information. They don't question it. Um, you could show them the facts on your own, but it's just not enough. You know what's interesting about this, um, Brian, uh, if you look at the Twitter files, um, and that's a very useful exposure, uh, some of the things were exposed there, and you looked at the amount of um, FBI, CIA, NSA, DHS employees that were embedded at Twitter under Jack Dorsey. Some of them might still remain under Musk. It's it's unclear how, how well they purged all these people, but they didn't do this purge. There was no Facebook files. There was no YouTube files. There was no Google files or LinkedIn files. In other words, um, we, we have a very strong indication based on the independent journalists that exposed a lot in the Twitter files that there are quite a few uh, FBI, CIA, NSA, former former quote former employees at meta so they're in charge of policing facebook and instagram content censorship suppression profiling all the rest of it uh and youtube as well and google massive censorship operations there literally open back door into these big tech firms from these agencies and then through the global engagement center uh, and some of these fake NGOs they've constructed uh, to help out uh, with the job. Stanford, uh, I think, Internet Observatory is one of them, uh, headed by the former CTO, I think, from Facebook, Alex Stamos. Um, so they've really spread out and diversified and created this this whole sort of machine. And then they they work with NGOs like the Southern Poverty Law Center, the ADL, who you've covered before, the Ban the ADL uh, uh, hashtag campaign, which you we we spoke about on this program before and you can kind of see here uh brian how this is constructed so the adl do blacklists they profile they profile people the southern poverty law center create like red i was i was put in a category called the red brown alliance because i opposed the u.s uh dirty war in syria that made me a fascist according to the Southern Poverty Law Center and their, their sort of investigators. And I got put on this long blacklist where they say it's a communist and fascist coalition. They called it the Red-Brown Alliance. They literally invented it. And myself and a bunch of other people are on it, fairly centrist on many issues. But anyway, they didn't like our foreign policy. Is it, Brian, there's a connection here with government policies, with big state policies, and, a, and, a, and a, a, they're coalescing with these NGOs, and then they're working with big tech. It, it, it's one sort of uh, self-feeding system, and it seems to be uh, very active, um, although it's been exposed. So I'm, I'm, I think that's where some of those lists, those long, extensive, exhaustive lists you're talking about, Brian, come from, from some of these organizations. We just found out this week that, indeed, the Biden administration has been using the Southern Poverty Law Center, uh, to provide it with all of those profiling of domestic hate or domestic extremists. So uh, it's absolutely incredible, especially in light of what's happening now uh, in, in Gaza. We can talk about Elon Musk in a minute, but I don't know if you've come across any of these or have anything to say about the ADL um, and their role in some of this as a, as a sort of actor and also the Southern Poverty Law Center. Well, I despise both groups, but uh, I would say that um, I, I know that the Southern Poverty Law Center is definitely working with Meta. Um, they have some sort of contract in place at this point. Uh, the ADL, I haven't really seen too much, but I wouldn't be surprised that they're not involved. Um, I mean, uh, th there, there's, I think the thing is, uh, on the right, we do not invest in these NGOs like the left does. 
And I think that is, uh, that's a big thing. And maybe that's because of uh, media perception and how it can be relayed to the public. Because a lot of people don't understand this stuff. When you, uh, when you throw at them like an extremist list, they think it's, uh, it's 100% factual and they don't think it's politically motivated. But um, there's another aspect to it that we need to uh, address, and that's the financial aspect. And we know, you know, you were just discussing before about Google. I mean, they, they have tremendous wealth. We know that. Uh, but there is also another trend that I've noticed. Uh, when Elon Musk took over, uh, the Tesla stock started to drop. And within the year, uh, it dropped, uh, I think, around $40, maybe $42, 40, 41 ish And you see the inverse with meta platforms meta went up 45 dollars this year so i think uh it's it's a little bit of the well a lot to do with the funding um awareness uh also having those nonprofits that will you know uh will will embolden these lists and put them out there. I mean, there, there aren't any uh, right-wing NGOs that have lists, hate lists. It's only the left. And they know that they can use those hate lists to basically, uh, you know, put someone uh, down a notch uh, or maybe uh, disenfranchise them from uh, career opportunities, uh, you know, banking, etc uh th there's just so much that they can do just by putting you on that list um and that's why i think a lot of conservatives are afraid to stand up against these things and speak up uh like i know a lot of people from corporate media um that that will acknowledge the things that i write about and they'll say that they're true but they won't repost it on twitter they won't talk about it because they know there there will be consequences, and I think that's what separates you know corporate media from the independent journalists. And I think right now we're seeing a, a surge in independent journalism that is revealing a lot. And you know I think it's remarkable. I think it's a very good thing. And I think you know uh, corporate media will eventually fade out uh, on the right at least from what I'm seeing. But on the left, I, I don't know, maybe it's something different. Um, I just, it's just not the same. Uh, the ideology has something uh, big in, in play with it. And then obviously the identity politics that the left uses. I mean, I'll say just on threads, I don't go on there a lot. And my, my whole feed is about, you know, race, gender, uh, sexuality, and I'm just like, where did this come from? Uh, I'm not looking up this stuff. And it's all, you know, the left wing talking points. So this stuff is being boosted. And I'm sure it's going to be heavily boosted uh, right before the election. Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, you know, how this is going to look uh, in the run up to the 2024 election. I want to talk about a few more aspects of this with our guest, investigative journalist Brian Pupfell. We're talking about the 2024 election, domestic interference, domestic meddling by some of the richest people on the planet. Uh, what does this entail? We've got some more uh, to delve into this after the break. I'm Patrick Henningsen, your host. This is TNT, today's news talk. We'll be right back. You're with Patrick Henningsen on today's News Talk Radio, TNT. Welcome back, folks. Welcome back. We're in the final segment here, the first hour. Uh, we're joined by investigative journalist Brian Fail. Joining us right now, talking about a piece uh, which he's recently written, exposing some of the exploits of Mark Zuckerberg, Facebook, Meta, and big tech in general, and how the uh, plans are set for another round of meddling in the 2024 election, exactly like we saw uh, in 2020, and exactly like we saw in the 2022 midterms as well. Certainly, I can speak for the state of Arizona. Uh, Carrie Lake and others down ballot were robbed of their offices according to most people who've looked at this seriously and the evidence is pretty overwhelming uh so in other words we're gonna have to do another round of this madness again in 2024 uh brian fail thank you for rejoining us now um let's talk about uh we talked about facebook instagram google youtube 
uh, an absolute cesspit of censorship and partisan politics and all sorts of other not so great things. Um, how about Twitter, which has now been rebranded as X? So Elon Musk is going to play a central role in this story coming up. And a lot of people, Brian, are sitting on the sidelines wondering, what is that role going to be? Is he going to capitulate to the pressure from government, from the intelligence services, uh, from advertisers? Because clearly this is already happening. Uh, so t t I want to I want to hear what you think about the genesis of Elon from the start with the ban the ADL hashtag controversy, because that's when things started getting interesting. Go ahead, Brian. Uh, well, with ban the ADL, um we had more uh, dissident, dissidents and uh, nationalists that were speaking up and they were able to uh, garner an audience and actually uh, speak to Elon Musk. And Elon Musk was becoming more aware of these issues. Um, but, you know, uh, the, the, I guess you could call them the establishment. They don't, they don't want us to question the state religion of America. And there is a state religion. I mean, it's it's undeniable. Uh, it is Zionism. I don't I don't think that would be controversial to even say. I mean, they always say our greatest ally is Israel. I don't think it's Israel. I think it's the UK. I think it's Britain. Um, I mean, there's just just history to show it. Uh, but I, I I think you know there's there's another aspect to it as well that chimes in. Uh, with uh, America becoming less Christian and more focused on these type of uh, ideologies. Um, for instance, I think most people in America, when they think of the most evil entity that, uh, that has ever been or, um, you know, exists, they automatically go to Hitler. And as Christians, I'm a Catholic myself, we look at the devil that's that's the worst so i i think a lot of this stems from that that influence um and, and we know that uh jewish people uh hold uh significant uh power in this country and uh they have two routes there they have two routes they, they got the uh the secular zionism which I think I can appreciate because the Jewish people don't really have uh, a state or a country of their own, but then there's the religion part as well. Um, so I, I think it's just, they're trying to maintain that as much as uh, possible, especially after Elon Musk started to agree with dissidents and agree uh, that there was significant influence here. Um, but, you know, uh, when it comes to this stuff, when, when you're labeled as an anti-Semite, you're demolished. You don't have a career. I think that's, that, that's even considered worse than a racist at this point. And I mm -hmm. think Elon just, he just couldn't handle it. I mean, he's the richest man in the world. And he couldn't match them. He couldn't. So that's where the, uh, that's where the pressure where, came. The pressure came direct to his... To his business model they're going after adl going after advertisers and basically saying there's a proliferation of hate speech on x twitter and elon saying hold on at the, i remember when this happened he's saying hold on i've got the stats here we've got the data there's not there's actually a reduction so like but he they're threatening to destroy and blow up his business model by put by brigading and putting pressure on all these advertisers and they've really stepped that up um, as well, and really targeting certain accounts, demonetizing them, making sure that they can't make money off the content, uh, and so forth. So it is very aggressive. And he also sued, uh, said he was suing Media Matters. I don't know how that lawsuit's going. Uh, David Brock and Co. Uh, there, they're part of this story as well, Brian. Um, that sort of George Soros-funded wing there of this sort of NGO complex. 
that you mentioned before. Um, so, and the Israeli lobby are also kind of looming over there. That's that they're, they're in the picture. That that's some real hard power in Washington, uh, well financed as well. Uh, they'll act like a little bit of additional muscle, I think, uh, when you're getting up to the congressional and Senate level there so there's there is look arguably a lot of pressure on musk the question is what's he going to do about the pressure that is coming to censor and suppress election interference or content that's dangerous to our democracy or undermining confidence in our institutions you've heard all these tropes uh from the previous uh elections how is he going to fare? What? How do you see this playing out? I know you've you've sort of reported, written a lot on the dynamics of the ideas around um, these political issues, and 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 Musk himself. Go ahead, Brian. Well, we have to remember that uh, Trump isn't on X right now. Uh, he's not utilizing it. Um, I personally think that they will try to prop up. Um, uh, a, a pro-Israel candidate at, at this point, which we know is uh, very much so uh, Nikki Haley, which is possibly why she comes up in my feed all the time and I don't even follow her or interact with her. Um, so that's how I see it. But in regards to other aspects of the election, I mean... <laughs> Uh, there, there, we know that there's going to be suppression. We know that there's uh, going to be censorship. There's going to be bans. It's going to be a tremendous wave of bans uh, after his visit to Auschwitz. But I, I just don't um, know if it's going to be like a, a left-leaning boost or uh, promotion. I think it's, you know, I, I think the Israel lobby basically has full control over uh, X at this point. And I wouldn't be surprised if he's trying to work with some of these groups. And as per uh, you mentioning about his lawsuits, he said that I'm pretty sure he said that he was going to sue the ADL and nothing became of that. So, you know, when he says these things, I think it's just to kind of hype up the right to make him uh, feel like uh, he's free speech. He's on their side. Uh, and I, I do think he was trying his hardest in the beginning to, to remain neutral. But, you know, let's be honest, the, the Israel lobby is just way too powerful. Uh, they, they will take you to the ground. That's it. And you have to be, I mean, with all eyes on him, and obviously he's the most visible account now that Trump's not using the platform. Musk is arguably the most visible and followed account, the the one that uh, everybody pays attention to when he quips or makes a tweet and whatever. So, like, if he puts if he puts a word wrong or something that could be called into question, even if it's a part of a sentence, how it, it literally he will be gang tackled and he was uh, gang tackled. And then he's had to go do all these struggle sessions on Twitter spaces with like a whole panel of 13 rabbis and a former Israeli president and Ben Shapiro there uh, as the quote moderator. Uh, and then this trip to Auschwitz, which I think was a very uh, uh, political a uh, very political uh, photo opportunity media event, um, really signaling that um, we're we're you know signaling to the Israeli lobby, signaling to the U.S. government, to other governments that we are with Israel. And so, do you think that was a bit of a self-defense move on his part? Because if we do agree that he's under pressure, um, that would be a very pragmatic move by Musk. All these things that we've seen uh, in order to keep the shop open so to speak, or prevent further sort of, you know, flanking attacks by the establishment. Um, is, is that a fair, is that a possibly a fair assessment? Not exactly too sure. Um, it might've been just personal for him, but not for the betterment of the platform. Uh, you know, if, if you're being inundated with these accusations, um, it can be too much, uh, even even for the richest man in the world. Um, I, th th that's just the reality of it. Um, I, I, I think if, you know, I think things would be a little bit different if Trump was on the platform. Uh, in that case, then I think that there would be a, a lot more 
deboosting on the right. But I think it's going to be more targeted on uh, the America First groups, the nationalists, um, and they're going to be labeled, obviously, as put on lists and labeled as hate groups, etc. I think that's the real target. Um, uh, as for, you know, uh, propping up the left, I, I don't see that being priority on X. Um, but who knows? It could be different. Uh, Trump could go back on the platform and you know, these these NGOs could start going after him, saying that uh, go, going after Elon, saying that he's saying hate speech, etc. But, you know, it's all up in the air. We don't really know yet. Yeah, there's also I'm, I'm going to add to another thing that um, we can, you know, address later at another date. But the, um, there's a lot of uh, PAC money, uh, super PAC money going in to buy um, boosting on these platforms and you can do that if you, you you can put a few hundred thousand dollars in uh in boost content on x put it'll put it right into people's feeds so nikki haley interesting one interesting one so nikki haley uh her 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 turnout in new hampshire it's not all republican voters and we find out this uh, primarypivot.org interesting organization here uh learn how to vote for your state's Republican primary or caucus. This is a, definitely a Democrat uh, organization. Uh, so it's about people temporarily changing your party affiliation during the primaries uh, and vote uh, in your state's Republican primary or caucus for the remaining candidate challenging Trump for the Republican nomination, Nikki Haley. That's primarypivot.org. So this is like tactical voting on steroids, Brian. And it's like a symptom of, I think, what you're talking, this 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 chronic um, syndrome that America is suffering from now with all the money going into this. They're literally weaponizing every single loophole and aspect of the election, the media, social media, to the point where I don't know how, if this was a closed Republican primary in New Hampshire and you couldn't do this temporary tactical switch, what would the re, what would have been the vote? I think it would have been 70, 70, 30, maybe in New Hampshire. That's what some pollsters were saying, like uh, other who've been talking about this last couple of days. This is insane. So we're, we might see more of this, who knows, but it is kind of scary, uh, Brian, because the Democrats also, they just basically deep six, the whole Democrat primary that they, they're having writing campaigns for Biden because they didn't want anybody else to run against him. That's basically what they did. So like what <laughs> all this tradition in America, we have primaries. Now all of a sudden we don't have primaries. What's next? The electoral college. Are they going to go for that as well? Uh, your final thoughts on, on, on this 2024 election, Brian? Well, let's be honest. Uh, both parties do not uh, represent their constituency. I mean, just out here in Long Island, uh, the GOP is backing a Democrat uh, to run for uh, a district in Nassau County. And the only reason is because she's a staunch Zionist. Uh, she's former IDF. I mean, like both parties are the same. They are the same. It's just that, you know, there's they, 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 they want to have this constant struggle session to kind of uh, have us look at that and not the reality of what's going on here. And if you do question the reality of what's going on here, you're going to be labeled. You're going to be put on lists, et cetera, blacklisted. You know, that's it. So, you know, th that's why it's no surprise to me that uh, that they're trying to do that with Nikki Haley. Um, I mean, she is, you know, uh, a firm uh, establishment politician. But it's like, who represents us at this point? Well, in terms of Haley, uh, it's it's the defense, the military industrial complex, uh, 100%. Um, the same with Mike Pompeo, who is another sort of uh, kind of artificially inflated uh, character who basically that is that is literally the reincarnation of Dick Cheney right there. So he will be presented as a vice presidential candidate to Trump as well, even though he kind of stabbed Trump in the back, they will present him or Haley or one of these people uh, to to as the as the deal to Trump. Probably a lot of people believe that that's the deal Trump's going to be given. You take our VP and our cabinet 
And you can go through, Donald. Go ahead. We'll let you through. But under these conditions, kind of like uh, very similar to how Citibank basically picked Obama's cabinet uh, when that information was uh, revealed at the time. That shocked a lot of people because Obama was seen as a kind of populist left-wing uh, candidate. But uh, when, in fact, it was Wall Street that was absolutely backing uh, Barack Obama uh, into the presidency. It really speaks to what you said, Brian. Both parties are not representing the interests of the American people, sadly. Brian Fail, thank you very much for joining us on TNT this week. And I want to point as well, give a shout out to where people can find your work. Uh, BrianFail.com. Uh, I also have a sub stack on there. You can follow me on Twitter. Just search Brian Fail. Uh, it's all on there. Uh, I got a lot of great work, uh, and I hope you can read it and enjoy it. That's it. Uh, we've tagged as well at 21 Wire. You'll see Brian's article at the top there. Follow him on X Twitter and every other platform where he is writing and posting. Brian, thank you. And thank you also to our viewers for the first hour. We're going to have more coming up after the break. Trish Wood, Christian James. We're going to go to Gaza. We're going to go to the farmers' protests in Europe. Looking forward to that. So stay right there. We'll be back in a few.